This is my commute. Or, well, I mean, this is the sound of my commute. This is the representation of my commute in sound. My commute, I'm doing finger quotes in the studio right now. It happens only once a week, and it's to an office in midtown Manhattan where I shoot this YouTube show I make. It's called Idea Channel. What you're listening to now is that same commute, but instead of heading to the studio where I shoot, I'm headed next door to the studio to a bar where I'm meeting a friend who's in town for the day from Boston. She's a mechanical engineer. Um, she works on water filtration systems in developing countries. Uh, on the way, I stop and I eat a slice of pizza. But right now, still walking to the train from my apartment. I used to do this a lot, actually. Not walk to the train from my apartment, though... I did used to walk to the train from my apartment more than I do. Okay, anyways, I used to do this a lot, meaning record my commute, or something like it, some common process that I'd engage in regularly. Uh, I used to make the recordings on this little handheld Radio Shack mini cassette recorder that actually I still have. I picked it up and I looked at it trying to both remember and figure out how much recording time would be on it because I knew that I'd need at least an hour for this. I think it maybe records for only about 10 minutes, though I couldn't tell for sure. For this, I settled on my Zoom Q2 HD video recorder, which also happens to have a really great microphone. Anyway, I used to do this a lot. There'd be a thing that I did all the time, so much so that it kind of became, I don't know, invisible? Like the process of walking to class in college, of getting to work soon after I moved to New York, of making coffee in the morning once I started working from home. And once I realized that these things became this sort of automatic set of actions, that's when I would record them. And the point was never really to have those recordings, as clearly evident by the fact that I have no idea where any of them are anymore. Some of them are probably still on that tape I was fiddling with. Some of them are probably on an old hard drive stuck in a drawer somewhere. And that's fine. The intention is not that they would see the light of day or vibrate the air of rooms with ears in them. The point was that the process of making the recording always renewed the process being recorded. Today on Reasonably Sound, we're going to talk about that and about active listening and probably at the end at least a little bit about accidental surveillance. There's this thing that happens, and anyone who's ever made anything and then had to do it or place it in front of an audience, it, they know this feeling. It's the feeling of seeing something through someone else's eyes. Where before you were maybe blind or in denial or just simply unconcerned with certain aspects or qualities or whatever of the things that you're making, a dance, a cake, a story, a song, a presentation. 
when you are finally confronted with the practical reality, not the eventuality, not the threat, but the actual happeningness of putting it in front of other human beings with feelings and opinions and senses, suddenly all the stuff that you didn't know or care about takes on a whole new, I don't know, maybe patina is the word? It's the same. The thing is the same, but it changes, and you realize something about it that was invisible to you before. This kind of thing happens to me when recording the parts of my life that are dull or mundane, repetitive and familiar. The microphone is a silent witness. Its presence reminds me to listen, and changes those mundane activities. They take on a whole new something. By its hearing, and again, scare quotes, do machines hear, not really, it reminds me of the reflexive passivity of my own hearing. It's tempting and comfortable to check out of our own senses. And I don't mean this in that mealy-mouthed way trying to get to this point that we all need to live more presently and we don't spend enough time in our bodies and all this other stuff. I think it's nice to pay attention to the world around you, but it's also exhausting. Not to mention every body, with a space between those two words, experiences the world differently, and some of them have to experience the way that they do for reasons beyond their control. Deeply engaged perception is tough, and its work and our senses are almost always on, and so it becomes a necessary part of being a human being in the world to distance ourselves from our own perceptions so we can think and function and self-reflect and relax and whatever else. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. What I find is that in the way there are these details revealed about the world when you go from a cool, air-conditioned house to the blisteringly hot outdoors, or when you turn on a light after being in a room which has slowly become dark as the sun has set, there is some change in resolution, some sudden awareness or outlining of present features when in those moments and processes where we are comfortable being at our most automatic we resist or acknowledge that checking out, or whatever you want to call it. There are a couple different kinds of active listening, and if you've heard of it, probably the one you've heard about came from one of those books that teaches you how to negotiate. Or maybe it was advice from a relationship counselor. It's when you attentively listen to the things someone on the other side of a conversation is saying, subtly acknowledging when they make new points and resisting the urge to formulate a response before they've finished speaking. We're not talking about that kind of active listening. Not directly, at least. The best way to describe the type of active listening I'm talking about here is with a visual metaphor, I think. We've all had this experience while reading a book of having flipped through some number of pages before realizing that we're not really reading. We've just been looking at the words. And maybe some number of them are getting further than our eyeballs, such that a general impression of the action taking place is developing, but for the most part, we've missed all the details, while half focusing on the text and half focusing on, you know, paying rent, making dinner, whatever other thing is probably significantly less exciting, but certainly more pressing than whatever it is that's happening in the book that you're reading. 
This kind of thing is how we generally listen to the world. Sounds wash over us, and if one of them gets through and grabs our attention, then great. But for the most part, we're unengaged for all of the reasons described above, and probably many, many more. There is something here, probably, about ye old listening versus hearing dichotomy, but I won't wade into it except to point out that maybe such a distinction exists, and this is a possible illustration of it. When you read with great investment, mentally conjuring the settings and activities described, considering the unwritten attitudes and motivations of characters as the action progresses, it's more mentally taxing, but there's so much more drawn out of the experience. Active listening is similar. Instead of letting whatever the wash of sound in your environment is just, well, wash over you, you attempt to involve yourself in its sources details, placement, qualities. At first, it'll probably seem like there's a lot less to mentally conjure for the sound in your environment than there is when you're reading a book, but I think you'll probably be surprised. Step one is just paying attention. What's happening? Where is it coming from? Actively involve yourself in your audio environment. But then step two is to think about the quality of the sounds you hear, regardless of their source. Why does that engine sound the way it does? Why do footsteps or jewelry clings happening around you sound the way they do? Think about material. Think about the performance of those things. Step three is thinking about the way all of it is interacting. If the world were a piece of music, where is the rhythm? What are the chords? How does one thing follow another? Don't try to impose a form or anything, but just let one emerge, and there may very well not be one. And step number four is to think about what all of this is referencing. Michel Chion called this semantic listening thinking about the references and messages, meanings, intended and not, of all of the sonic activity around you. What's brought to mind by the distant street musician, or by the call to prayer played through a broken speaker from a nearby window? By the rumbling of a train or the screech of tires? This is, in my mind, the most active part of active listening. Mentally and manually resolving all of these signs to the things we automatically connect them to through vision. The screech comes from a car stopping short to avoid hitting a bicyclist. Duh, because I just saw that happen. But if I dig deeper through just the sound of the tires, what else do I get? I get action films and car chases racing to the hospital because a pregnant woman's water has just broke. I get particularly brash bird calls and horn squeals, threatening string arrangements, and this one door in my apartment that makes an awful sound when you open it too fast. And to where do all of these things lead? Any of them back to the environment that I'm currently in? Of course, this framework isn't just for outside. It can be used for music and for movies and for whatever else you might listen to. And its complexity is maybe a little insight into why the critical listening process of any piece of art requires several goes. 
There's a lot to think about. And lots of process. Lots happening at once. A veritable thicket of sound thoughts. Out in the world, unless you are recording, there's no re-listening, and so to a significant degree, it is an exercise in futility. If you charge yourself with the goal of reacting to everything, actively listening to it all. I tend to think of it like batting with the weight on. So walking outside with this thing in my jacket, the recorder, that listens completely dispassionately, but listens nonetheless and listens to everything, gives equal importance to all of it, which is to say no importance, and maybe therefore only importance, it reminds me of my capabilities as an involved listener and of the things I can learn and the meaning I can make or invent for the world as I move through it. It causes me to appreciate the things which, out of convenience and habit and reflex, I've chosen not to appreciate. And it gives them a renewed significance sometimes, if only for a short amount of time. But okay, there is one not silent elephant in the room that we should talk about and conclude with. It's the thing we all hear when we're walking out in the world, unless it's, you know, some rural landscape, and a thing which is already laden with so much meaning it's hard to resolve or read past its surface level without just significantly more information. That thing is, of course, the human voice. Electronic music composer and former assistant music editor to David Lynch on Twin Peaks, Kim Cascone tweeted last week, quote, Overheard. Field recording is like security camera footage, but without the picture. And after doing my field recording active listening microphone in my jacket experiment, this was something I could not stop thinking about. I walked by people on the street and bought things from people working in shops, stood next to people on the subway and the subway platform, and I captured all of their voices. Some of them I was very conscious of it, thinking, oh no, I am recording you right now, and you don't know it. And is that bad? My mind would race towards the thing I know is not true, that people in public places have no reasonable expectation of privacy, but that's, I mean, it's just, it's not that simple. And also, that doesn't make it not weird. Some people, I didn't even think about it while it was happening. I was busy thinking about and listening to other things, and only after going back over the recording did I end up thinking to myself, oh snap, I can hear very clearly what this family is saying to one another. Is that surveillance? I honestly don't know. At a certain point, it becomes a semantic argument. Well, what defines surveillance, and does my regularly scheduled active listening experiment fall into that framework? So. We'll skip right to saying it's not, and then everything is fine, but boring. If we skip right to it is, definitely, surveillance, what happens? Suddenly I feel forced, or 
maybe encouraged is a better word, to draw connections between this technologically inspired surveillance via active listening experiment to other situations where one might listen actively without the aid of technology. Eavesdropping, probably chief amongst them. When I am actively listening to a conversation that I am not involved in, am I not eavesdropping? And is eavesdropping not at least somehow a subclass of surveillance activities? The walk from eavesdropping to surveillance feels long, because unless you were to write down the contents of the dropped eaves somehow, this doesn't scan as surveillance based upon any of our common understandings of that word. It needs to be mediated, doesn't it? Surveillance. But whoa, now we're getting into semantic arguments about what media is, what technology is. Pen and paper captures, but it doesn't capture the voice of the speaker in their own performance, only the content, none of the actualized self. So is that media? Is that surveillance? Are we talking about technology? I don't know. I'm realizing that I'm wading into territory far beyond my original scope here, so I hope it will be forgiven if I end with a rather vague question that I have no real answer for. When one listens, like a microphone, aided, however, by whatever we might call technology or media, maybe with an actual microphone, maybe not, is one asserting some dominance? Is this active involvement in one's sonic world some form of inspection, observation, scrutiny, that we might read as an expression of power, that we might consider political. In other words, is active listening like security camera footage, but without the picture? Or the permanence? My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. If you like Reasonably Sound, it would be super rad of you to give it some stars, however many you feel is appropriate, of course, and a review on iTunes. We're trying to figure out how to make this weird thing a weird and sustainable thing, and as it turns out, stars and words on iTunes make a huge difference to the various and sundry powers of difference making that be. Other than iTunes, you can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram and Twitter, at ReasonablySND. And you can find me, Mike Rugnetta, on all the things, at Mike Rugnetta. In case you missed the announcements on Twitter last week, I was on the Justice Points podcast, a social justice-themed gaming podcast hosted by a couple friends. We talked about all manner of things, Sunless Sea, um, me almost buying a, a Lamborghini in Forza 5 for $40, uh, what may or may not count as capital F feminist video games or sci-fi. So it was a great, it was a great time. Um, I'll put some links to to that and their podcast in the show notes if you want to check it out. On last week's episode, I played some subliminal messages and asked you to tell me what they were, and I got some great responses. Brian White slash Cinema Suicide didn't get any vibes, but had some crazy daydreams of being on a boat on another planet. J.C. Tecklenburg, otherwise known as Picaro20, wrote, The sub-message is clearly subscribe to Idea Channel and keep listening to Reasonably Sound on Infinite Guest. While both of those things are true, they were not embedded in last week's episode. In every other episode, yes, but last week's, no. 
I made both Ben Whittle and Vanessa Hill want to quit smoking, even though they don't smoke. I wonder if there's a market for subliminal messaging tapes that both cause and cure bad habits in one go. Just so, you know, like you felt like you've accomplished something that day. And finally, Nathaniel Cabal wrote, The subliminal messages made me want to be kind to strangers. I was also compelled to look for a Patreon page. Pretty close. Actually, well, except for the Patreon page. The subliminal message in last week's episode was actually a reading of Frank O'Hara's poem, Now That I Am In Madrid And Can Think. Which, due to copyright shenanigans, I'm not going to read fully non-subliminally into the microphone right now, but it's a super great piece, and it's about being in love with someone who's on the other side of the ocean. It's, it's just, man. I mean, I really like Frank O'Hara. This one, highly recommended. Oh, and of course, before I forget, the ocean which separates Reasonably Sound from its beloved is that of the Infinite Guest Network from American Public Media.
bus service. Connection is available to the past train.
Can you just get a regular slice? I think it, and uh, warm is great if that's possible.